Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the newly released entry to the Assassin's Creed series, Assassin's Creed Mirage, and see how it stacks up both visually and from a gameplay perspective to the previous mainline installment from 2020, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. For this comparison, both games are being played on the PC, with the graphics settings pushed up as high as possible at a native 4K resolution. Upscaling solutions like FSR have been disabled, and post-processing effects like motion blur and chromatic aberration have been switched off when possible. Also, I'd like to thank Ubisoft for providing me with an early access review code for AC Mirage. Alright, so let's kick this comparison off by first discussing the presentation on offer, starting with the design of the character models. Now, as you may remember from my previous videos covering Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the character designs, especially those of the lead characters, are exceptionally well done in this game. Eivor is remarkably well detailed for a third-person model, with 4K texture maps, subsurface scattering, realistic ambient occlusion techniques, and some nicely detailed hair rendering that really help bring that Viking beard to life. Even when using the game's built-in photo mode, we can see an insane amount of detail, even when looking at things like his eyes. With little blood vessels and irises being properly represented, the character is nearly flawless, though you may remember I did point out this one little visual hiccup that looks weirdly muddy and low res when compared to everything else. An issue that, even more strangely, also persisted with the previous game Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Assassin's Creed Mirage, thankfully, does not make the same mistake again. Every bit of Basim's clothing and accessories hold up perfectly fine under close scrutiny, from his elaborate leather spalders, belts, greaves, and van braces, to the little cloth tassels that appear to independently flow from under his hood. The design is highly reminiscent of the classic Altair outfit first revealed back in 2007, only with a little bit more visual flair like additional color variety and other small details to give Basim a unique look and personality. Of course, Valhalla is quite the opposite in this regard, in that Eivor's default outfit, and most of the outfits designed for the game, are inspired more heavily by Nordic settler garb, with things like animal skins, bulkier shoulders, and typically, the iconic hood worn down. Players can always use their quick inventory to put the hood up, which plays a direct role in the gameplay as a method for initiating social stealth. But even then, it never really did evoke the same classic Assassin's Creed vibes, especially not to the extent that Mirage does. Next up, let's talk about the environments. Like with the character models, the environments in these latest Assassin's Creed games are some of the most beautiful in the series to date, with vast open valleys, dense forests, and incredible vistas. Valhalla helped to introduce the series to the next generation, building off of the design established with Origin and Odyssey, but bumping up the scaling to an even greater extent. Valhalla takes place towards the end of the 9th century, during the great Viking exodus from Scandinavia to the British Isles, and follows the journey of Eivor and his band of Viking marauders as they attempt to make a new home for themselves in the heart of Britain. In doing so, players are able to freely explore pretty much all of England, including various villages, churches, castles, and even the remnants of the old Roman-ruled London prior to its revitalization a decade later. Moving over to the new Assassin's Creed Mirage, we get a far different world to work with. Mirage takes place a little over a decade before Valhalla, in and around the beautiful, rounded city of Baghdad in the year 861. The overarching design of this game world harkens back to the series' classic roots, with a bulk of the gameplay experience being contained within the dense urban sprawl of the city itself. By doing this, Mirage does a far better job of capitalizing on its core features, emphasizing player mobility via parkour moves in a way that just wasn't possible anymore with the environments created for games like Valhalla. Alongside the superior parkour potential, the world of Mirage also sees the return of dense civilian populations, providing players with tools to easily blend and outsmart their opponents or even distract and lure them out of your path. Despite this return to form, Mirage does maintain the same technical quality featured in Valhalla. Textured surfaces like those found on walls, streets, and dirt roads are still disappointingly low res when compared to the textures we found on the character models. Most of the assets appear to be brand new, with some great variety at play to make each and every city street feel unique from one another. 
Though, despite the major palette changes that were made, there are a few interior spaces that have a very familiar scaling and placement, which should become immediately apparent to players who've invested a lot of time in the past several games. Still, there's no denying that the world created here is probably one of the best in the series yet. Even though it sticks solely to its desert theme, 9th century Baghdad is remarkably vibrant and colorful, with some gorgeous areas, especially within the interior circle, in what is likely the upper class district. Every street is brought to life with hundreds of NPCs all doing their own thing, and the overall atmosphere just feels more lively and active than any of the larger areas in Valhalla. For players looking for more space, the surrounding districts outside the city gates offer plenty to see as well, including large structures to climb, vast deserts to traverse, and hidden oasises and villages to discover. Within only the first few hours, I was immediately hooked with Mirage's new setting, in a way that never really clicked for me personally in Valhalla. This style of city was and always has been the perfect playground for Assassin's Creed, and it's more clear than ever that throwing the protagonist out into these big open valleys does a disservice to things like parkour and social stealth. Next up, we have the lighting. Once again, the changes here aren't necessarily an improvement as they already established a nice baseline previously with Valhalla. According to one of the lighting artists from Valhalla, there are multiple layers to either game's lighting design that are combined to give the game its general appearance. There's the base directional light coming from either the sun or the moon that's used predominantly throughout the outdoor environments to cast a light on geometry and assets. This is then coupled with some nice global illumination, allowing for simulated bounce lighting in certain areas most commonly demonstrated when walking under covered structures, still exposed partially to directional light above. To give it that more full look, the lighting artist then set the percentage of volumetric fog depending on the area that the player is exploring. This is why you get this really foggy, dense, and bluish tinge to the London area, but a bright, warm, and vibrant look to areas out in the wild. These fog volumes are also increased regularly in the morning and evening time, allowing for sunlight to pour in over the horizon for picture-perfect scenes whenever possible. Then there's the interior spaces that have lighting rendered with more traditional methods, mainly local lighting to guide the player through narrow paths, and occasional static god rays to accentuate details and complement the environmental artwork. Dynamic lighting, like those activated with the player's torch, is sadly limited to these darker interior spaces only, as it fails to cast any light against the surfaces of geometry outside during the day though they did at least activate this effect to work during the night, casting shadows from most nearby objects with a decent level of accuracy. Again, Mirage has all of this. It's virtually identical in terms of the techniques being used, though it's difficult to tell at first glance due to the drastically different game world being illuminated. For one, there's a lot more opportunities to see those volumetric effects in action, as the sand and dust throughout create the perfect excuse to really bump up the volumetric percentages more often than before. Light regularly pours in around the buildings and will bounce off of the colorful tree flowers and other thin fabrics, or at least that's how it appears in specific areas. Both games also feature a similar method of screen space reflections, applying them mainly to the bodies of water like rivers, lakes, and smaller puddles or pools. The reflection quality itself isn't hugely improved here, though because the surface of the water is almost always waving around in these games, it makes determining improvements more difficult. Shadows similarly have negligible changes here. The character and asset projections cast by the primary directional lighting all look fairly decent in either game, with almost no discernible edge shimmer or dithering. Though you will notice more of a softness to the shadows in Valhalla, whereas most of the shadow projections in Mirage feel overly sharp. It's possible this is just situational and depends on the current weather conditions and time of day, though every time that I checked, the shadows in Mirage always appeared sharper than those in Valhalla. Another noteworthy change is the removal of those rolling cloud shadows. This is interesting, as the effect was new to Valhalla at the time, and said to be made possible by the increased power of the next-gen platforms. While it's not entirely clear why it's missing this time around, it's possible that the increased complexity of the main environment could have something to do with it. Or it could just be as simple as an artistic change as well. Another feature that appears to have been scaled back, or just flat out removed, are the unique fire propagation systems built for Valhalla. 
Throughout Valhalla, players can go on raids and burn down nearby thatch-roofed cottages using torches. Doing so would cause fire alpha effects to slowly spread across flammable surfaces, much like the fire mechanics created for the Far Cry series. Though they also added in with it a cool post-processing effect within a radius around these burning structures that steadily changes the color tone to make the area appear as if it's filling up with smoke and ash. It's possible this effect still exists in Mirage at more scripted moments throughout the game, but for random fires started by the player, the same effect doesn't seem to be present. Water simulation, on the other hand, has been retained more or less. Sure, there's no big ships to sail around on larger bodies of water, so you won't see those large waves crashing against the boat, but the overall reactivity of the water looks about the same. That being said, the shader applied to the character model once they get out of the water does look improved in Mirage, as the effect no longer looks like the character is wrapped up in plastic like before. Moving on, let's talk a bit more about the gameplay mechanics. Now, I've already spoken at length about many of the new features added with Mirage in my preview earlier this year. So for this section, I'm just going to try and be brief and highlight the more important changes that have been made, starting with the core mission design and structure. In AC Valhalla, players were given the opportunity to conquer the English Isles by staking their claim in certain territories and then completing key missions in the corresponding areas. Players have the freedom to pick and choose which territory to go after first, though completing all of them is required to progress the story into its final act. AC Mirage takes a much simpler approach to its campaign experience, harking back to its original format of linear storytelling, requiring players go mission to mission to experience Basim's adventures in Baghdad. The story is much easier to follow, and usually more focused on gathering intel to perform high-profile assassinations, a staple of the series that has weirdly been neglected for the past several entries. The side content seems to be more focused too, albeit more limited as well, scraping all the immersive minigames and activities in favor of objectives built more specifically around the hidden ones and their overarching goal. This also plays into the simplified progression system as well. Progression in AC Mirage is made purely through completing missions, whether they be main campaign missions or optional side missions. This provides players with skill points that can then be used to rank up either of their three skill trees. Valhalla, on the other hand, is much more of an RPG. The whole of the game operates on a power level system, with higher ranked players capable of dealing with higher ranked enemies in more difficult areas of the world. Skill points are unlocked by filling up the XP bar, which can be accomplished by doing most anything, including killing enemies, fishing, playing dice, or winning a Viking rap battle. Of course, the fastest way to rank up is still completing main missions and the side missions, otherwise known as mysteries, but there's at least encouragement to explore and play around with the sandbox on offer. In addition to skill points, players can also find more powerful gear like armor, swords, and shields, and then improve those items further using the blacksmith, either by upgrading the items directly or by adding in passive benefits via runes. Mirage, however, brings this aspect back to the basics as well. Players can still find new weapons and upgrade them, but they won't be hunting for armor to improve defense abilities anymore. Outfits are purely cosmetic, and stats like this are handled through the skill tree or other main upgrade paths instead. This goes without saying, but the Raventhorpe home settlement systems also don't return, which previously were used to offer players new objectives, among other passive benefits. Players instead report to the Assassin's Dens for briefings prior to assassinations, but there's not really any environmental customization on offer here either. For fans of the Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla games, this may seem like a major step back. Valhalla, and similarly the games preceding it, were all massive experiences, spanning entire countries with every inch covered in something to do or discover. Mirage, however, gets straight to the point. This is a game about parkour, stealthy assassinations, and swordplay, all built within a historical context. Everything about it harkens back to the series' true origins, with players able to sneak around in crowds, blend in, and strike their target without ever being seen. Valhalla had a bit of this, with things like the cloak system allowing players to blend in around restricted areas, but it all felt a bit clunky and forced. Mirage isn't necessarily as smooth and polished as some of the older entries in this regard, 
In fact, a lot of that Valhalla DNA is still very visible right on the surface. But the return of the classic gameplay mechanics, along with the level environments that lend themselves more clearly to the game's parkour systems, are all great improvements. And a reminder of what this series used to be in its heyday. There's a few new mechanics, like the multi-kill attack, that feels like it's lifted straight out of Shadow of Mordor or Splinter Cell Conviction. But otherwise, this stealth system should feel immediately familiar to fans of the series. The only real issue I have with either game, though, is the combat. For one, the lock-on system feels inconsistent, making it difficult to connect attacks at times because of the weirdly fast speed of characters moving throughout the environment in their combat stance. Combat moves are also very limited, leaning mainly on the various special ability attacks to help mix things up. Mirage feels even simpler, though, as players aren't given a chance to mix up their weapons with things like dual wielding or shields and are instead limited to only their primary sword and dagger, along with the hidden blade that only gets used during stealth attacks. The finisher animations are also pretty lackluster and repetitive, an aspect that was always a joy to experience in the old games, and it's a shame to see it all scaled down so much all these years later. Other changes worth mentioning here include the return of the old notoriety system, the removal of raids and naval combat, and the removal of the bow and arrow, in favor of classic throwing knives instead. The gameplay overall is best described as scaled down and more focused. I think there's certainly an audience here for that, as Assassin's Creed games, as of late, have gotten extremely tedious. Though for players looking for that massive 100 plus hour experience, Valhalla may still be the better option of the two. Finally, let's wrap up with a brief sound comparison. Which version do you feel offers the best audio quality and design?
Signatra unis pia et And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Assassin's Creed Mirage is both beautiful and simple at the same time. Visually, the game looks about the same, with a few minor improvements scattered throughout, and a setting that's arguably more visually interesting and appealing. There's not as many big open valleys and forests filled with lush plant life, but you do get far larger urban sprawls, with dense population centers, that I feel do a better job of playing to the game's most important mechanics. The game itself is far smaller than Valhalla, with a smaller map and much shorter campaign, but this is still a decently large game, on par with the likes of maybe Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I do wish the combat had been improved, with more cinematic camera angles and cleaner animation work, but the stealth action and parkour systems do seem to work decently enough, and so far I'm really enjoying my time with the game, more so than I did with Valhalla. But what do you guys think? Are you enjoying Assassin's Creed Mirage, or do you still prefer Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Let me know in the comments section. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week.